Well, thank you all for joining us um, today. And thank you to all the previous speakers. It's been so inspiring hearing about the huge range of work. Um, and I think it touches on some of the methods that I'll be discussing from the Living With Machines project. Um, so I was on the stage about a year ago talking about Living With Machines, um, but it was under embargo and I couldn't say very much. So it's been um, a great opportunity to look back at what we've done in the last year. And as you can see, in the last year, we've worked with almost 30 people, collaborators, co-investigators, associates, um, people who've worked across the project in different ways. So I'll quickly talk about the project and then look at some early results. Now, this is only going to skim over the surface of what we've done in the last year. And I'm very much aware that I'm representing the work of nearly 30 other people. Um, so I would encourage you to go to the website where you can see people discussing their work in their own words via blog posts. As we've come to the end of the first year, we'll be producing a lot more blog posts. Um, so you can subscribe to our newsletter to know when um, we've got substantial amounts of new content on the website, um, because there's just so much going on and I can't cover it all here. So the headline figures, the project is funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council and UKRI. Um, overall, there's £9 million. Of course, we don't see that all here in the library. Um, it's roughly uh, nearly five years, 4.7 months. Um, our aim is to rethink the impact of technology on the lives of ordinary people. Um, and if you're a collections person or a historian, that translates into thinking about um, lives in Britain between roughly 1780 to 1918. At the moment, we're working with sources including digitised newspapers, particularly courtesy of the British Newspaper Archive, Find My Past. Um, but we will also be digitising our own newspapers from the British Library's collections. Um, with huge thanks to Chris Fleet at the National Library of Scotland, we're working with Ordnance Survey Maps from their amazing digitised collections. We are looking at census, birth, death and marriage records. We're looking at digitised books and other digitised sources. And if you work for a cultural institution or know of collections that might be of interest, please do get in touch. We get a lot of really um, great suggestions from people and often we can't fit them into the research questions that we're asking, but it helps us form a network of people who are working in this related area. So I love this quote because it expresses what the Arts and Humanities Research Council is interested in. I'm very aware from the British Library's perspective what we're aiming to get out of the project, how we think it can help the sector, but thinking about from the Arts and Humanities perspective, um, what they see as the value in historians and data scientists collaborating. And I think that speaks to um, the opening keynote this morning as well. Um, the question of new perspectives is always hard when you're working in an area that people feel they already know quite well. So that's one of the challenges that we're taking on. How do we produce new results? How do we scale up historical research? What does it mean to be working in this area and collaborating across different fields? So broadly, our aims are to generate new historical perspectives, thinking very much about the mechanisation of labour. Um, and that has obvious resonances with the conversations we have in society now about AI and machine learning and data science, what that means for our jobs. Um, will our jobs be eaten by robots? Um, there are obvious sort of parallels that we can draw from then and now. Um, and I hope that in um, helping people access primary sources and the research questions around them, they give them new ways to think about what we're doing with AI in society now. We're also aiming to develop new computational techniques for working with historical research questions. So some of that is about helping historians formulate questions that can be answered computationally and helping data scientists understand why historians think the way they do about their research questions. For us, one of the big things is producing new tools and code that can be reused. So it's not just tools that we can use ourselves, but documenting, sharing, explaining, leading workshops, events, um, so that other people can kick the tires on our tools, make sure they work for them, um, and reuse and build on them. I want historians to feel that basic data science methods are within their grasp. One of the earlier speakers mentioned Jupyter Notebooks, and that's one of our key methods at the moment. They're notebooks, um, they look like a web page, they have text, but you can also click to run actual code over data sources. Um, and that makes things like data science just a lot more accessible than they might otherwise be. You don't need to set up a server or have a fancy computer that can do different things. So as part of that, we also want to help the wider academic and cultural heritage sector in using digital methods to answer research questions. So everything that we learn, we want to share um, with others so that they're not having to reinvent the wheel. Um, 
for us, an outcome is enriched data holdings. Um, that also creates amazing new challenges. What do we do if we have a million mentions of Charles Dickens in Victorian newspapers? If you're searching for books by or about Charles Dickens, you probably don't want to encounter all those mentions of Dickens. Um, so how do we mediate those results and integrate them into our systems in meaningful ways to aid the discoverability of our collections? And finally, we want to advance public awareness of data science methods and get people thinking about how digital research in the humanities um, can improve our understanding of history. For the cultural sector in particular, we want to provide models for research collaboration and partnership. Um, we've done a lot of thinking about how we manage a project of this size, how the British Library and the Alan Turing Institute work together. Um, we want industry, the government, <laughs> other... Um, areas as well as cultural institutions themselves to understand that galleries, libraries, archives and museums can lead digital innovation. There's a lot of storytelling that sort of says, why don't you ask Google to do this kind of work for you? And um, we have the answer that sometimes we can do it better than Google can. We want to improve working with large scale digitization. So this is the kind of bread and butter stuff of digitization workflows, data processing for analysis, um, ingesting enhanced metadata, how do you pass terabytes or petabytes of data around between different aspects of a project? Um, we want to incorporate the learnings and outcomes of research projects back into things like the Digital Scholarship Training Program, and hopefully through um, tutorials and standalone notebooks, enable other people to run training sessions in their own organisations about these methods. Um, and again, that relates to the ability to understand when and how to apply some of these advanced methods, um, as well as in an awareness of data science and digital history. So there's a lot of work that's happening in things like machine learning and AI across the cultural sector, um, but it's not necessarily evenly distributed and people don't necessarily know about some of the innovative work that's happening. Um, so we can help people do better storytelling about the work that's going on with data science. Um, one of the very library kind of challenges is developing a user-friendly model for um, dealing with the fact that our sources cross a copyright period. So some things are very easily made of available in public domain. Others are locked behind paywalls because they've been commercially digitized or because we can't trace copyright holders at scale. Um, so if we are looking at things like reproducible data science, how do we make sure that someone can um, apply our methods when not all of the records are freely available? So are we looking at things like on-premises access or other ways of managing um, access across those mixed right databases. Um, and finally, we want to increase uh, or incorporate digital content and data in our exhibition program. So how do we do an exhibition with data science based on newspaper records that is a compelling physical experience? How do we make sure that there's a reason for you to go and experience um, the exhibition content in person rather than, than just reading something online? So this time a year ago, um, I could talk about the project, I could say it was um, exciting and all going to happen, but I couldn't tell you the name of the project, I couldn't tell you really who the funders were. Um, so we were recruiting and we were sort of saying, come and work with us on cool stuff. We promise it's cool, even though we can't actually tell you really what it's about. Um, so we got through that and as I said, we have nearly 30 collaborators, project team. For members of the project team in the room, would you raise your hand? or collaborators, there's a few of you around. Um, uh, so that, just putting the team together has been a huge challenge. Um, and now I wanna talk briefly about some of the results and I apologize to anyone whose results I'm going to mangle because it does cross many fields. One of our biggest challenges has been incorporating the results uh, into shared systems. So we're using Azure at the moment um, ingesting the databases of newspapers, the files, the images, the metadata, figuring out what's there, what have we got in these bundles of content. Um, just even setting that up has taken quite some time. We use notebooks extensively. I think there are about 170 notebooks ranging from like hugely detailed ones used for deep dives on visual um, processing for maps to little scrappy things that have been put together to do a particular job. This one um, is looking at you know, what, database, what newspapers do we actually have access to at this point? We have about 1 70th of the data that we will have in the project at the moment. So we're looking to scale up quite extensively. And cloud computing is really the only way that we can manage this, but it also gets quite expensive. Um, but these are just examples of the kinds of explorations that we're doing to understand what's in the data sets.
We've done a lot of work. One of our key questions is around the biases in sources. So which newspapers were collected um, and ended up in the collections of the British Library via various means? What's been digitised? What hasn't been digitised? What's been left out? So we're looking at things like where newspapers were published, how they describe their circulation. Um, to understand how representative the digitised corpus that we work with is of 19th century press as a whole, we're looking to things like um, contemporary newspaper directories, which listed um, newspapers, described something of their leanings politically, religiously, uh, whether they were radical, um, or et cetera, so that we can have some contextual information to have greater confidence in the claims that we make. And I think, again, that goes back to this morning's comment in the keynote about um, how we have these different disciplines working together and what it means to work together like this and how do we understand each other's perspectives and answer each other's questions. We've created a sort of meta-visualisation that we're using with the historians on the project to help them pick which newspapers to digitise. So we have a list of about 2,500 and we needed to pick about 50 newspapers. Um, so this visualisation weights um, longer runs of newspapers, which we think means that there's a more sustained readership and therefore perhaps it's more representative of people's everyday experience. Um, we're also looking for underrepresented areas and audiences and comparing um, the extent to which a newspaper is available in microfilm, which is really easy to digitise from, or in physical hard copy, which has a longer lead time, might need conservation work, um, unbounding, um, all kinds of things. So it's a visualisation created for our use within the project, but we want to release it because we think it's also going to be a really good tool for other newspaper scholars, other newspaper um, collections to understand what's in our corpus and what's available. Um, our um, research software engineers and data scientists have been producing outputs like these conceptual models. Um, in some, ex to an extent, they've been adapted from things like Premise, which is used in digital preservation, but also um, is based on interviews across the project team to understand what kinds of data, what kinds of things people would need to say something about so that we can set up some shared data structures and have common points of intersection across the project. One of our other tasks is setting up a crowdsourcing interface. Um, really broadly, we're trying to understand the impact of mechanisation by looking at accidents. So what kinds of accidents were people involved in as machinery moved into the workplace? Um, the information that we gather from this can be used to train machine learning software to go and look for more articles in the corpus. Um, and also, as we record people's personal details, um, we can start to trace them through other records and understand the impact of that accident on the individual, their families and their communities. One really sort of exciting piece of work is developing tools for disambiguating and locating place names in text. So you might be able to see here that Newtown is highlighted. I think there's 14 Newtowns across the UK. Um, and coming from Australia, there are several new towns in Australia as well, and I assume around the rest of the world. So when a newspaper says new town, how do we know which new town they're talking about? Um, so there's tools for um, finding place names, detecting them grammatically or semantically in text, matching them as lists of named entities, um, but also resolving them and creating a database linked to other gazetteers so that we can make assertions and understand how place was used in these newspapers. And that ties back to other questions of changes over space and time. So this is just a hint of what we've done in the project. Um, we've used computer vision to analyse historical maps. Um, we've adapted OCR tools um, for using in maps. Um, uh, one of the other talks was about taking keywords. So we've got a lexicon expression thing, uh, expansion thing where we start with some seed words about machinery, or I think the other example was travel, and then find words related to those in the corpus. Um, we're looking at questions of agency. Um, so the sort of story now is from the sketch with computer says no. Um, how were machines assigned agency in stories about accidents? Did the machine, is it described as grabbing someone or is someone... Um, is it perhaps about the lack of health and safety or the, the mechanisms and conditions around how machines were implemented in the workplace? Um, we're doing a lot of work on structural and semantic parsing of historical texts, we're using active learning to match historical newspaper titles. Uh, newspaper titles change quite a lot over time and linking from one title to the other um, across different data sets is a challenge. Um, we're using census data to model the growth of regional cities. 
We're also doing a lot of work thinking about how we tackle a project of this size, um, what it means to work across these disciplines, um, how we publish together, how we deal with different timelines in publications across disciplines. If we publish a blog post, does that, someone, does that prevent someone else from publishing a working paper? Um, how does that relate to monographs? Um, so I would encourage you to have a look at the website, follow our progress, um, and thank you for listening. <laughs>